All right. When I was 15 years old, I was homeless. And I never imagined I would ever be up here on this stage talking to you right now because I didn't think that far into my future. My priorities were getting enough money for bagels. And if I was extra lucky, whoopsie, can I go back? Cream cheese. <laughs> my goal is to make you very hungry this morning. Um, my clothes I found at donation centers, books, necklaces I made if I had to, spare changing and begging strangers on the street for money, and 25 cents made a huge difference in my life. If I had a dollar six, it meant I could have a hamburger at Burger King. That was a big deal. I slept under bridges in abandoned lots. I squatted unused sheds and attempted hitchhiking from Phoenix, Arizona to New York because why not? I heard it was amazing there, the land of opportunity. The streets were paved with gold. I didn't make it, but I made it as far as Jemez Springs, New Mexico, where I lived in a commune digging ditches to earn my stay in the middle of winter. It looked a lot like this. You know, I don't have enough time to talk today about how I became homeless because I think that there's just too much to go into there of the reasons why, but I think it's more important to talk about how I got out. And pretty much, you know, I've often wondered, and so have others, like how against pretty much all odds did I make it up here on this stage? If you don't know me, I'm Cyan Bannister. I'm a venture capitalist at Founders Fund. It's one of the top venture firms in the world. I've invested in companies in my career such as Uber, SpaceX, Postmates, Thumbtack, Carta, Niantic, right here, and more. It's difficult to give a short answer as to how I made it here, but if I were forced to say it would be these five things. I've tried to distill it down into these exact points. So let's start with incrementalism. A lot of people tend to think that incrementalism is a bad thing, but how do you go from nothing to something at all? It doesn't happen overnight. Suggesting it does, I think, is irresponsible, and it's out of touch with the realities that a lot of people face. I look at every day as a new day, every moment as a new moment, every conversation as an opportunity to learn more. Little by little, I improved, but I still didn't look far into the future. I looked to the next day, to the evening. I set constant goals for myself, tiny achievements. When I was homeless, it was the bagel. It was getting a shower. It was my personal safety. It was getting better at all of those things. When I had a home and worked, it was about becoming better at every aspect of that job and striving to make more money constantly. The more money I was making was a reflection of the skills I picked up and the knowledge that I obtained. I turned everything into my life. Can we go back a slide? Sorry. I turned everything into my life in a game of leveling up. It's easy to judge that making life a game sounds gross, but it was a difference at one point for me between life and death. When I was 16, I became a ward of the state of Arizona. I was picked up by my favorite police officer, Officer Pratt. We'd become good friends. We were accustomed to these sorts of encounters by then. Usually I ended up in a group home, a detention center, or my mother would take me back for a short period of time, but this day was different. Officer Pratt took me to Dairy Queen. He got me some ice cream, then he took me to the courthouse where he got me a plate of spaghetti. He let me sit where the judge sits while I ate. And then after some time passed, I finished. A woman came in and told me she was my public defender. I had no idea what that meant. I wasn't sure why I needed to be defended from the public. It was kind of strange. But she explained that the judge was coming in, and so was my mother. My mother would stand on one side of the room when the judge spoke to me. I was to address him as your honor. My only response to all of this was, OK. It all happened so fast. The judge asked me some questions, and then the judge asked my mom if she wanted me anymore, and she said no. She didn't look at me. The judge rambled some stuff, told me I was officially a ward of the state to be released to my probation officer, my new parents. My new parents told me I had 48 hours to find a place to live, or I'd be placed in a girl's home. Having lived in those places before, I knew I never wanted to go back. I had to continue to go to school, I had to get a job, 
and I had to have a gallon of milk in my fridge. Yeah, that was a requirement. It's really strange. You have no lactose intolerance, doesn't matter. You, to be grown up, you have to have milk. There was no boys in my house. I had to submit to random drug testing, and I had to be home by 9 p.m. every night. I'll never forget the smell of the air and the sun on my face as I walked out of the courtroom that day. I was free-ish. I never had to go back to my family, but I had 48 hours to figure out adulting. I didn't have a phone. I didn't have a home. I didn't have a car. Just the shoes and the clothes on my body. I didn't have a job. I had nothing. I sat on the corner and collected my thoughts and went through all of my options. I had one friend who was an adult who lived on her own. So I walked to her place. Luckily, she was home. She let me stay. And bonus, she told me she was moving out soon and I could have her place, which meant I needed to get a real job. Up until this point, I had my hustle, some under the table illegal jobs. My first job was slinging mashed potatoes at Furs Cafeteria. It's a hot spot for elderly people touring Route 66 by Megabus. From that point on, just like the 48 hour time limit, I treated each day as a game in which I would try my hardest to level up on something, anything. I set weird goals for myself. I didn't always win the game, but every day I would get up, I'd start over. I played games like figuring out how to make 25 cents more an hour, how to use a cash register, what all the skills were that I needed to become my boss anywhere that I worked. When I found I could no longer play the game where I was, I moved on. I worked elsewhere. I was obsessed with making more money because that was the measure of success in my game. The game's called capitalism, and it actually saved my life. So like a lot of young people who care about other people, I started out as a socialist. And I thought corporations were completely evil. And eventually I realized that corporations and capitalism were the key to my freedom and ultimate success in this world. I started listening to the lyrics and the punk music that I jammed out to more. And I realized that everything that I actually believed was wrong. I moved to electronic music like you were listening to earlier. I tried to avoid words in my music while I tried to figure out what I believed. I eventually shed every bit of clothing with a brand, anything associated with me with a tribe. I didn't want people to sum me up in one look, and I wanted pe to keep people guessing. Individualism. There was more to me. I started reading business books. I started my first business, making and selling t-shirts. My life started improving for the first time, and I started dreaming about a future, a future in which I was a business person. It didn't really matter at that point what kind of business. I started to form my own identity. I was a person. I was cyan. I was capable of things. I had food in my fridge. I still had to put things back at the cash register, but I wasn't hungry all of the time. Individual is something I work on to this day because we aren't defined by labels or groups. We are multifaceted and a combination of a lot of things. I am not a woman, I am not a Democrat, I am not a Republican. We can all be part of a group, but we are always who we are, and we are all capable of independent thought. Mentorship and technology. You know, there were a lot of amazing people on my journey who taught me that I could be more than what I was. They didn't make me successful, but they told me that I could be. When I was homeless, I looked like one of those street kids you see on Upper Hate with the piercings, patches and a dog, spare changing. I was what we might refer to now as a gutter punk or a crusty kid. I met one of my best friends to this day, walking down the street wearing something that I made. The feeling of seeing somebody wearing something you created is just not describable. You are startup founders, you probably know when you see your logo out there. I stopped this person and we geeked out on making stuff, which led to an invitation to hang out and his phone number. We eventually did hang out, and he had something magical with him, a laptop. <laughs> Up until this point, computers were something that were not for me. They were unobtainable, they were expensive. I would just break it. I had no use for one, but when I saw him sitting there in the cafe, in the dark, I knew I had every use for one. 
I could feel myself yearning for it. And I asked him, can you get online with that? What else can you do? He showed me all of his art, the stuff he was coding at work, and he took me to a place where we could dial up together. The sound of that modem, and if you've never heard a modem in your life, I recommend that you listen to it, was like the wind on my face stepping out of that courtroom again. And before I knew it, I was on a thing called IRC, Internet Relay Chat, chatting with people all over the world. I was reading about things I was curious about, and I was absolutely hooked. I didn't want to do anything else. I suddenly knew my future, and it had something, anything, to do with that thing and the Internet. Chris exposed me to a world I never knew was possible. He introduced me to Hacker Club for the first time in my life. My friends encouraged me to get a tech job. I didn't know how, so they told me if I started at the very bottom, I could work my way up. I like this. It sounded like a new game I could play. So we decided on telephone tech support for dial-up. We role-played for a few days. This was the Windows 3.195 era with the clouds on cyan-colored background. And when they were satisfied that I knew enough about TCP IP, DNS, Trumpet, Windsock, I set off to interview for a job. I landed my first tech support job working at a place called Extreme Internet. I was on cloud nine. I had a desk, a computer, a chair, a phone, and I had a pager. I was grown up. I thought I'd finally arrived. And for a short period of time, I became complacent. How could I possibly want anything more? I had a damn chair. So in between calls, I registered domain names. They were free then. And when they were no longer free, you could register them until the $100 bill came in the mail. And then, you know, it was yours for 90 days regardless. The co-founder of Extreme Internet, this is him, Lee Burton, came over and stood over me one day, and I looked up at him as he plopped a book on my desk. Thud. He took his fingers and he tapped on it and he said, you're far too smart to be sitting here registering domain names. You should read this instead. How do you know I'm registering domain names? Read the book. You'll figure it out. That was creepy. When he walked away, I tossed the book in the corner. Who the hell was he to tell me that? I wasn't going to read that stupid book. What's wrong with registering domains? Nothing. A few months later, I looked over at the book, which was collecting dust, and I cracked it open, and I read about 15 or so pages, and on one of the pages, it changed my life trajectory. It was a page about the power of root on a Unix operating system, and the book was called The Essential Guide to System Administration. On that page, it went through great details to explain that one should be super careful with root access and went through the ways that people make common mistakes that allow people who shouldn't have access have it. The thing that stuck out to me was something called a shell escape. Basically, if you run a script that executes a command as if it were root, you can escape out of the script when it's running and gain root access. I thought about all the scripts we used at Extreme Internet and which one I should try it on. You know what? Password resets for our dial-up users. So I ran the script, I escaped out, then I had to read the book more to figure out what to do next. I finally typed, who am I? And the shell responded, root. I jumped out of my chair. I couldn't believe it. I next figured out if I had the password, if I had a password, root must have a password too. So what do you do when you are in this situation? Well, you change the root password. So I did. I carefully wrote the password on a little piece of paper, hardly able to contain myself. I walked into my boss's office. I slammed the piece of paper down in front of him. What's that? He asked. Your new password, I said proudly. That book you gave me is amazing. He looked puzzled at me and said, impossible. So I told him to try it. His old password didn't work. His new password did. After a walkthrough of how I did it, he said, you know what, Cyan? Go grab a chair. Come sit with me. You're now a system administrator. <laughs> he gave me a promotion. That day I became his Padawan. In a lot of situations like this, I think people would be fired. Lee, on the other hand, saw what I was capable of, and he nurtured it. He taught me all about Linux, BSD, how the internet actually works, how to set up routers, DNS servers, email servers. He trained me for two years. I went from making $8 an hour to $15 an hour, which was a truly life-changing event. A lot of my friends who are in the tech industry in Arizona 
during this period of time started moving here to Silicon Valley. A friend of mine one day emailed me a link to Google and told me to try it out. And I saw the I'm feeling lucky button. And I don't know if you guys remember that, but you would type in something and it would give you some random website. And maybe it had something to do with your search term. Maybe it didn't. It was then that I realized because of this button <laughs> that everything magical I wanted to be a part of was here in San Francisco. I told Lee I had to leave. It was time for a new Padawan. He promoted and trained my friend Jessica, who now, because of his nudge and opportunity, is a software engineer. I threw everything in my car in 1999 and I moved here and I didn't have much of a plan. There was this guy I was seeing on Craigslist. That was my plan. The guy and I broke up, so then there was just Craigslist. I landed my first job and I went from $15 an hour to 35 which in San Francisco is probably about the same as what I was making in Arizona as far as it gets you for rent. I played the game some more, many jobs, learning how to code, foregoing a lot of friend time and late nights until I finally broke six figures in 2003 because of Pat Peterson and Scott Weiss from Ironport. Scott Weiss was the CEO and one of the founders. He was the first person that I confessed to that not only did I not go to college, I was also a high school dropout. They both gave me promotions and enough stock over the years, they're based on my performance, that eventually once we sold to Cisco years later, I had more money than I ever thought I would ever have in my life. So towards the end of my career at Ironport, I started dating and eventually married that guy. That's Scott Bannister. I had this windfall from my equity, I didn't know what to do with it. I turned to Scott for advice. Should I buy property, stock market? He says, well, you can do what I do and put it into incredibly risky startups. Scott had identified that I was a super user, an early adopter of pretty much everything. He'd been angel investing for 10 years and before I joined him, he noticed that I was using every product he was getting intros to months ahead of time. So he started asking me for advice about things like Twitter. But honestly, you couldn't ask for a better mentor than Scott. My first angel check went into SpaceX. I was terrified. But it was exciting. I was literally blowing up my money on launch pads. Money I'd slept under my desk making years and years of working super hard into rocket ships. I became addicted. My husband and I figured out that our division of labor worked really well for us. I like giving talks like this and going to events and taking first meetings and while he likes to sit on the couch, he's introverted, he prefers to work at home and meet very, very few people. And then there's this guy, Brian Singerman. He was on the board of a company that I started. He had just joined Founders Fund. He started off as an associate and is now a general partner at our fund. We'd often get together and make bets on companies, talk about the world of investing. One day he invited me to get coffee with him. I thought it was just another one of those days. And then he said, Cyan, how would you like to join Founders Fund? They had just closed their sixth fund and they needed another person and they needed to help expand the team. This is a question I thought I would never get. I was on the short list of people they thought would be a good fit. Brian told me at the table that my track record and the deals I've done qualified me for a role, a role I didn't think I would ever have, and that he believed that someday I'd be one of the greatest venture capitalists in the world. I'm still working on that. <laughs> I still had to interview after days of interviewing. Here I am. And when I found out I landed the role, I felt that wind on my face again. I have a chance to play in a new arena and have stretched myself intellectually. I'm always searching for the wind and somehow I'm here. Again, just about against all odds, I'm here and if you ask me how I did it, I can only tell you that I was endlessly curious. I surrounded myself with people smarter and more capable than me. I played the game every day, I still do, and nobody was around to pat my back. I learned how to give myself props and believe in myself. Also, I can tell you that mentorship isn't something that needs to be formal. Lee knew he was mentoring me, but some of the most profound things that happened to me were not formal arrangements. For example, at TC40 in a room, this is the first disrupt, it was very small, you know, Mike Arrington put me on stage because he found that I had something important to say. He was the first person who believed in me. Or Jason Calcanis, for one time I was getting on stage, stopped me just before I got on stage and he said, you know, knock him dead. You earned this. You can do this. You can help people without spending much time at all. It's all about how you approach life and who you give opportunities to. 
if in a position to do so and face it. Every single person in this room is in the position to give someone help and advice and to tell someone, great work, you can do this. We can be our own worst enemies. I made my own luck by simply waking up every morning and telling myself I could do anything. By getting out there, meeting people, and simply showing up, I created opportunities. And sometimes I failed miserably. But we don't get perfect scores in any game we play. We stomp around, we scream our fists at the sky, we take a deep breath, and then once again, we press start. Thank you.